president of Nigeria, President Mohamed Buhari, is advocating for an unlimited supply of safe coronavirus vaccines to everyone. In a video message to the 75th session, <clears throat> Beg your pardon, of the United Nations General Assembly, President Buhari said Nigeria will continue to partner with the World Health Organization and other countries to ensure accelerated development of a vaccine. He pledged Nigeria's commitment to work with member states to promote uh, human health and general well-being. Worried that the pandemic has devastated the world economy and strained health systems, the Nigerian leader is calling for effective multilateral actions in the fight against COVID-19. Uh, Buhari says the administration has embarked on policies and programs to provide a future uh, of hope for all Nigerians as regards COVID-19. Uh, let, let me come to you on this, uh, Tundu. Vaccines, the president speaking, safe vaccines. Work being done as regards that? Well, I'm on the fence about vaccines, I have to say. I never thought I'd be an anti-vaxxer at all, mm -hmm. because I am all for the science. But with, with regards to coronavirus, what we know so far is that wearing a mask is more effective than the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Apparently, even when one is prepared, no matter how safe it is, it's got 70% um, efficacy, mm -hmm. whereas wearing a mask has 90% efficacy. Mm -hmm. So I'd always, you know, lean towards that, just mm -hmm. on that basis. Okay. Dr. Abati? <clears throat> well, the uh, president's uh, speech at this... Uh, 75th uh, General Assembly of the General Session of the United Nations uh, was quite interesting in terms of the many themes uh, that the president dealt with. First, uh, he, he stayed within the thematic focus of the uh, General Assembly, mm. which is about uh, the future we want, mm. uh, the uh, United Nations we need, and then uh, uh, confronting the challenge of coronavirus through a multilateral action. So the theme is about the future of the UN, the future of humanity, uh, the uh, UN itself, and also the importance of uh, multilateralism. And it talked about the future that will be uh, uh, defined by hope for humanity, uh, by prosperity, and a United Nations uh, that will pursue its objectives as a multilateral uh, institution and that will be driven by the original principles of solidarity and international cooperation. And that theme, I think, is very important uh, to, the, to the extent uh, that, you know, multilateralism is increasingly being replaced by unilateralism. Mm. And even in the face of uh, COVID-19, we've been seeing a lot of insularity on the part of countries that should uh, uh, open up uh, to the world. Now, the uh, president then went, of course, beyond that to use the opportunity to sell Nigeria. And I think, I mean, that's a very useful platform uh, where you can sell Nigeria. And Nigeria's readiness to partner uh, with the uh, rest of the world in moving the world forward and in serving the interest of the uh, Nigerian people. And of course, in that regard, he outlined some of the things that the Nigerian government has done, either in terms of the stimulus package, packages or the uh, medium-term development plan, uh, Agenda 2050 in that regard. Uh, 20, 20 to 2025, 20, 20, uh, 2025 to uh, uh, 2030. Yeah. Those are the medium term plans. And then, of course, uh, uh, he then took on some of the major themes uh, that are of interest. Vaccine, which yeah. you just talked about, is one of those. And he's saying Nigeria is ready to cooperate with the rest of the world. And you know, we are part of the COVAX Alliance, yeah. uh, where we've also been talking to uh, uh, Pfizer uh, to see how you know, we can get the uh, vaccine. Whether we have the capacity to contribute to the research uh, is another thing entirely. And then the other things he talked about, uh, Alliance for Poverty Eradication. Uh, in that regard, he was talking about the CBM providing 3.5 million, uh, Nigeria providing for 22 million uh, households. Uh, he talked about nuclear disarmament. Mm. Uh, he talked about uh, the challenge of uh, terrorism and counterterrorism mm. and the need for the world uh, to do a lot about small arms and light weapons uh, proliferation, uh, which in particular pose a major threat uh, to security in Africa. So these are major themes yeah. uh, that are of relevance uh, to the world. I, 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 Dr. Bati, just to cut you in, I think, I think we have a, a thought to this. Let's see if we can just you know, see the president live in pictures talking about this. This is an opportunity to commend the efforts of the United Nations and the World Health Organization in combating the coronavirus pandemic. I note with appreciation the two billion United States dollars 
Global Humanitarian Response Plan launched by the United Nations Secretary General to fund the coronavirus response in the poorest countries of the world. That Nigeria is committed to working with other member states in the spirit of global cooperation and solidarity to promote human health and general well-being. Nigeria will continue to partner with the World Health Organization and some countries to ensure accelerated development and manufacturing, as well as uninhibited supply of safe and effective coronavirus vaccines to all. In order to mitigate its impact on Nigerians, our administration has commenced the disbursement of the sum of 10.9 billion naira to households and micro, small, and medium enterprises as relatives. All right, uh, we had the president there live in picture speaking about. So, do you just want to chip in something? Yeah, I just want to ask you: Will you and you be rolling up your sleeves for a vaccine? Yes. Yes. Well, yes. I mean, it looks like that's the only uh, solution. Yeah. As Anthony Fauci was saying yesterday at the uh, Senate. It's either you get the vaccine or you wait for herd immunity. But for you to have herd immunity, 70% of the population would need to have been So, 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 Dr. Bati, I would even like to challenge that herd immunity mentality. You know why? Because if there was a stat that came out yesterday that said six in ten Americans have probably had COVID at a point, why is there no herd immunity yet in America? Why are the cases still rising? Well, Fauci says... Well, six in ten falls short of 70 rate. to 75%. Yeah, but that's a sizable number that you need to start seeing herd immunity and the numbers trickle down. Yeah, because apparently Sweden has started seeing yeah. herd immunity. And when you even look at the way the immunity forms, there are some people that recover from COVID, they don't get immunity. When you do yes, an antibody you have, test, you don't have really yeah, case, you don't get immunity, you have repeat case, cases. That's to go, to go yeah. back to the uh, president's speech, so, I mean, he, he dealt with... A number of themes. Uh, we've identified quite a number of them. He talked about also education. He talked about human rights and Nigeria's commitment to uh, uh, human rights. He talked also about illicit financial flows. Mm. You know, uh, the, the speech was quite on point. I was concerned, though, that it was rather long, 49 paragraphs. Mm. Usually, uh, you know, that kind of address on the floor of the UN, you are allotted just about five minutes. Mm. But virtually every leader that made a contribution mm. spoke for too long, mm. you know. Uh, but in any case, it's interesting to see that uh, Nigeria is, uh, you know, on top of his game within the international great community. Well-written speech, by great, the way. Great one. Very good say. flow. I'm, I'm happy and you, you would know. You, you no. said well-written speech. <laughs> Very good Because you, you've been on the heels of the they speech writers recently. <laughs> and uh, if, you see, if you say the leader spoke so long, at least they did speak longer than Mama Gaddafi when he got his chance <laughs> at the Onga. That's all on headlines. Take a short break now. When we return, we'll have the duo of Rotos and Aaron uh, to give us updates on African business and COVID-19. Stay with us. Welcome back. Still the morning show right here on the Rising News Channel. Our dependable Rotos Adir is here to give us Africa business update. Rotos, over to you, Mr. Rotom Kwa. Uh, yeah, thank you. Good morning, Rafai. Good, Good morning, Sundu. Yeah. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so the Central Bank of Nigeria has just released, uh, just yesterday, the uh, Purchasing Managers Index for the month of September. The PMI, of course, is a survey that's carried out by the Central Bank where they talk to manufacturers and ask them how things are going. Employment levels, um, production levels electricity supply and so on and so forth. Um, so what we're seeing, if we take a look at the chart here, it's uh, PMI came in at 46.9. If you see that red line growing across the chart there, that's the threshold for, um, that divides expansion from contraction. If you are above 50, you are expanding. If you are below 50, you are contracting. As you can see, the gray, where the green line cuts across the horizontal line since March, where of course the um, uh, lockdown came into effect, um, the manufacturing sector has been contracting according to the survey responses that the central bank has received uh, from manufacturers. So this is, I believe, the you know, fifth month or so of contraction that we've seen. Although you can see between uh, late between June all the way through to uh, early to about August, it's been climbing, um, but it's still below 50. So there's still a lot of work to be done with, res with respect to getting the manufacturing sector back up to where it needs to be. Um, we move to food. We're about to take a 
a, a, a listen here to uh, Governor Badaru uh, Abubakar um, of uh, Jigawa State. He represents the Northwest uh, of the Food Security Council. You're going to listen to him saying that bulk purchases of food from COVID-19, as well as some state governments, um, led to the increase in food prices. Take a listen. Produce get expensive, food get expensive, because who, all the stock have started going down, and even the farmers that keep some to eat have probably exhausted and they have to go to the market and buy. So the demand is becoming higher. And this is also exacerbated to, because of the fact of that there is bulk buying by Kakubit, by most of the state. He bought a lot to, to distribute at palliative. He bought a lot in the state to distribute at palliative. And we bought a lot. States are buying. Federal government is buying. Uh, Kakobit is buying all at the same time in the same market. Yeah, so, uh, you know, that's, um, look, well, a lot of that is correct. Kakovid 19, the coalition against COVID-19 has, of course, we've covered it here on Arise News, the palliative distribution that was supposed to reach about uh, 10 million Nigerians through about 1.2, almost 2 million households, state governments, federal governments. But um, there's a bit of an, in, an inaccuracy there. What he's talking about is demand pull inflation. So there's, there's, you've got demand pull inflation and cost push. Demand pull inflation is where you've got a sizable amount of demand that pulls prices upwards. On the other hand, you've got cost push inflation. Cost push inflation is where supply is affected. And when supply of food is affected due to a number of structural issues, that is going to cost push. It drives costs upwards and inflation rises. So let's look at the inflation uh, chart here. This is the consumer price index. This is the, the Bureau of Statistics has been reporting this now for forever. And this chart is showing you from August of 2019 through to August of 2020. You can see that since August of 2019, right when the border was closed, that food um, headline inflation has been in double digits from 11.02% up to 13.22. So it is, it's not accurate for uh, Governor Abubakar of Jigawa to say that because of bulk buying, that is what has led to the increase in food prices. If you remember the statement that Garba uh, Sheo put out on behalf of the president when he was lamenting uh, food prices increasing, he never said anything about um, uh, bulk buying causing that. So it's important to, you know, for viewers and everyone else who have listened to the statement, because we reported it yesterday on the Global Business Report, to make that distinction that what Nigeria is facing is cost push inflation, the border closure, supply chains affected by the lockdown from COVID-19, violence between herdsmen and farmers, Flooding, like the Kevi State's um, rice output that's been hit by about 25% from flooding. So uh, the infrastructural issues, the roads, bad roads, lack of storage facilities, power, those are the things that have been you know, uh, you know, pushing up food prices in Nigeria, and it's not, um, it's not, it's not bulk buying. Um, moving on to the governor of uh, the Central Bank of uh, South Africa, uh, Mr. Lesata uh, Kiyango. Um, he's got a, uh, a, a quote here where he talks about, he gave an interview talking about Monetary policy says that no amount of quantitative easing or the reduction of interest rates will produce the kind of skills this economy, that's the South African economy, needs. You do that through appropriate education policies. He has another quote here that I thought was very interesting in the wake of um, central banks across the world holding or reducing interest rates. He also says here, we've just reopened the South African economy, yet we have electricity load shedding, you know, the ESCOM issues. You can't solve that problem using monetary policy. That tells you you've got a structural problem. And this was an interview that he gave. So interesting in light of uh, recent events when we look at you know, the rules that central banks have been taking and whether or not monetary policy can solve some of these structural issues. All right, I have a great comment of that. Uh, uh, about ESCOM to be particular, and, 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 and the governor of the Central Bank of South Africa has said it very rightly. You see, prior to handing power over in 1994 to, you know, black-led leadership in South Africa, ESCOM used to be a poster child of how effectively organizations can run. I'll give you the stats. ESCOM used to churn out more power than the country of South Korea mm. prior to 1994. ESCOM was the brainchild of everybody's effort. But since 1994, there's been a dwindling prospect about ESCOM, no skilled manpower to fill it up, mm. and ESCOM now is a whipping child. So it just shows you the structural integrity of institutions, yeah. how it can make or mar a nation's progress. And except South Africa fixed the education policy, 
they are going nowhere. South Africa has done a lot of QE. They've, you know, printed money. Their bailout was about the biggest in Africa. Mm. You can't throw money at lack of skill. Right. It's not possible. It's like building something on nothing. We can, you know, circulate money in the economy, create a gyroscope of funds for people to be able to dip for. But if you don't have skill, right. nothing can be done. And I hope Nigeria is learning from that too, because we have that problem too. Indeed. No skill. Well, let me comment quickly on uh, your analysis of uh, the causes of uh, food inflation and, uh, you know, uh, your comment on the statement made by the governor with regard to food security. I, you know, you cannot be more correct. I think the only missing link is a point about uh, policy flip-flops, uh, the confusion that we've been seeing in terms of uh, policies relating to uh, food security. And then, of course, the governor and other government officials, they continue to insist at the meetings of the National Food Security Council that prices of uh, food items, uh, particularly crops, are going down. Now, that is not proven. Uh, it's either they go to a different a market that is totally different uh, from the one we see, we go to. Because as I tell, the last uh, report by the MBS was talking about food inflation at 16 percent. Yeah, that's one. Two, uh, the PMI report for, for September uh, from the CBN. Now, the uh, sectors, the subsectors that uh, contract, uh, that uh, passed the 50 percent uh, threshold. Now, if you look at them, they include electrical equipment, uh, transportation, and I said, well, transportation. At a time, the country was shut down. Right. So I don't know whether you have an explanation for that. Then cement was also mentioned. Was there construction activities going on uh, during the period of the uh, lockdown? So that's something I don't quite understand in that PMI re report. Now, if you look at the uh, sections that, uh, the subsectors that contracted, you will find chemicals and pharmaceuticals there. You would think that the pharmaceutical companies will be uh, functioning uh, during the lockdown uh, due to the peculiarity of the circumstances. And then food, was uh, food and beverages, you know, also listed as having contracted. That's below the 50 percent uh, threshold. Well, that contradicts what the, uh, what the uh, governor of uh, Jigawa State was saying, that there was increased demand. So I don't know what explanation you have yeah. for it. And then, of course, the non-manufacturing uh, uh, subsector, the PMI for that, you know, of course, uh, dropped, dropped yeah. to 41.6%. Uh, right. So you have to remember, doctor, these are surveys. It's central bank is simply just asking businesses, hey, how is this going? How is that going? Then they aggregate the responses they get, and that is what feeds into their report. Those subsectors, it's representing just a gradual pickup from where the bottom that we faced in March. If you saw the chart again, the chart has been going up from June to about July, still August, but they were still below 50. So if, if you, for the three of you, there could be three different manufacturers. Tundu could say that transportation has gone down. Doctor, you could say for your business, your manufacturing business has gone up. Um, um, Rufai could say his has gone down. If they aggregate the average between Tundu and Rufai saying it's gone down, and you saying it's going up, then they will report it as going up. So it's an aggregate. It doesn't, it's not really supposed to be um, a, a point on point reflection of what's happening is just an aggregate of what manufacturers um, are, are saying. But based on what they're seeing on with the regards to transportation, education, and so on and so forth, that's how they respond to the, uh, to the survey. I've been careful of not quite using the PMI as in a, a leading indicator for what GDP is going to say. It's just supposed to give you the, kind, the, the temperature of what's happening in the manufacturing, uh, manufacturing sector. Okay. Thank you, Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. All right, Rob, we'll take a short break down. Where we return here on like Kerry Jala. Uh, we'll give us a COVID-19 update. Just stay with us. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back to the morning show right here on the Rise News Channel. For updates on COVID-19 pandemic, Aaron Akerja is here with us. Aaron, good, great to have you. Good morning. Yeah, good morning to you, Rufai. Good, good morning to you. Tindu, looking as elegant as ever. Can you move Yes, already? and Doctor, good morning to you. Uh, <laughs> good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> All right, let's get straight into it. We'll start it off from um, the global outlook of COVID-19 as of this morning. And looking at the figures that are actually coming in, 31 million, over 31 million cases have been recorded. Like we have actually said, just shy of 300,000 cases are coming in every, sing I mean, every single day right now. 
and that's actually a massive upsurge. You can actually see there, all right, the figures coming in over 300,000 in the last 24 hours, all right, 302,979, up by another 8%. Uh, which is kind of troubling, and we'll talk about why it's actually troubling at the moment, while some are still touting that that might also maybe have a silver lining. But in the meantime, we're seeing debt actually regress. We can see it's actually slowing down, all right, minus 13 percent. As of yesterday, reports actually coming in with 6,412 deaths recorded in the last 24 hours. Moving on, we can actually see that some places we're seeing um, rising cases still remains Israel. We'll be talking about Israel in a moment. Israel has seen massive, massive rising cases, and Netanyahu has come under immense fire in, seeing, in his handling of COVID-19. Another president or another world leader that has come under immense scrutiny about how he handled the issues surrounding COVID-19. Argentina was seen. The Latin America has also rise. Spain confirmed they're in the second wave. Czech Republic, Peru, Belgium. France from Europe also experiencing a second um, rise in COVID-19 cases. The United States also, but although the cases are actually deepening, they've tried to flatten the curve. Not as much as Israel or Argentina, I must actually say, or Spain, who are in the second wave. Now, moving away from that to the deaths, uh, looking at it right now, like we said about the South Americans, we're seeing rises in cases from Argentina in terms of deaths and also Paraguay. Israel also, and also Spain. Spain right now, a lot of countries are beginning to ban Spain. Uh, there are major travel bans from Spain into their country because at the moment it's only the right thing to do. Now, moving away from that, as we actually look closely, now let's actually talk about uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and how things have actually gone with Israel. There's been a lot of talk. Okay, first of all, Belgium. Belgium right now are opening restrictions in terms of COVID-19. They are saying, even though the cases are still rising, but they said they feel that the Prime Minister is feeling that at this moment that it's time to begin to relax some measures and relax some prohibitions so that people can begin to maybe assume some sense of normalcy like they've actually done in previous times. Which, whether it's a good move or not, it will tell, because that brings us to what we've been speaking about if we look at Israel. Now, Israel has seen a major rise in cases, and Benjamin Netanyahu has come under immense pressure. As a matter of fact, there are massive protestations as to how he has handled it, calling for his resignation. And it's been very, very dire. What is happening to Israel? We brought the, we brought the statistics, and you've seen how things have actually played out as Israel heavily has been criticized for how they've handled it, although they are claiming that this next, the lockdown measures that they've actually put in place, looking very grave at the moment, are still the best way to go about the, some of these things. Now, before we come back to that, in the UK also, the UK, we've spoken about Boris Johnson and also how he's handled um, the whole COVID-19 issue. At one point in time, he touted test, um, test and trace as one of those major things that might be a game changer for COVID-19. Clearly, the UK government has failed in the whole test and trace issue. And Sir Kestama has actually been very critical. Yesterday, they had massive exchanges on the floor asking questions that Boris Johnson could not give right answers or straight answers to in terms of how they've handled COVID-19. And he's come... He's been one of those pushing the envelopes in terms of COVID-19 and how the UK government has actually handled it. And the UK government have not been able to really give answers in terms of the efficacy of test and trace. We know how imperative it is. If it's in a society where it's working, it actually helps stem the spread. Because usually, there were, uh, the talks were that when you're around, when you're around, when you're going around your daily beauty, all right, you could just get a buzz on your phone that you might be close to someone who has been infected with COVID-19. So you to actually create a sense of caution for you. But that has not even happened as we speak to you right now. All right, we've been speaking about Israel and what happened with Netanyahu. But let's also tell you that that hasn't stopped the government in Israel to actually go out there and actually create, uh, turn a parking lot into a makeshift hospital for COVID-19. We're beginning to see rises in deaths. We're beginning to see rises in cases in Israel. And the government are trying as much as possible to ensure that they open up and create capacity for themselves and for the country to, to be able to handle this. And whether or not Netanyahu will be able to stem this particular tide is left to be seen. But at the moment, Israel are beginning. They've found out one very, very 
grave fact, which is the fact that they opened their economies and they opened the nation too early. They celebrated too early and they are paying the heavy price for it. And that should be a lesson to other nations out there who are, who are thinking of probably opening too early when it is not safe. It's better to be, as I say, it's better to be safe than to be sorry. When it is not fully safe, we need to tread with caution in terms of COVID-19 because as soon as you open the economies, you begin to see an upsurge in cases. But before we actually go to you guys this morning, let's talk about herd immunity. A lot of, a lot of talks have been, have been touted about herd immunity. As a matter of fact, there was a congressional hearing yesterday where in the Capitol Hill in the U.S. where Dr. Fauci and several key people spoke about COVID-19 and the whole vaccine race. And, and at the moment, Dr. Fauci has said that it would take 70% of the U.S. to either get vaccinated or get, or get infected to be able to achieve herd immunity. Now, that, actually, that picture actually shows what, just to explain to people what herd immunity actually means. It means that you can actually see the one person in the middle there if he has COVID-19 and he spreads it to other people, and other people have COVID-19 and they have recovered from COVID-19, that means that they cannot become spreaders and ultimately limiting the spread of COVID-19 there. Whether it can be achieved or not is left to be seen. Although, a, although somewhere in Brazil they are claiming that they've been able to achieve herd immunity, it's still left to be seen. Governments around the world are trying to stay very far away from this, or experts themselves are trying to stay very far away from this as maybe a solution or a quick fix to the COVID-19 pandemic we're seeing globally. Let's Apart from, from Sweden, okay, though, please go ahead. they jumped, you know, both feet into the whole herd immunity yeah. um, theory. They did not even have a lockdown period. Their yeah. restaurants, their schools under the age of 16 were open without Very any unusual. restrictions. Yes. And the rest of their Nordic nations completely rejected them. Swedish people were banned from traveling. Mm -hmm. But it appears that now the current statistics show that Sweden is actually faring a lot better than for the UK, for example, certainly far better than Spain. And these are countries that had strict lockdown measures. So yeah. I don't know what we're going to read from Although that. In Sweden, the top scientist uh, in Sweden at some point tried to uh, revise himself and say, well, yes, perhaps is. they should have done it uh, differently. No, but now he's kind of jubilant. Well, but... Because currently they're, they're a little it, bit ahead. He, well, had, he had a wobbly it, moment. Yes, he did. Well, yeah. maybe the, uh, the other countries uh, didn't do well in terms of closing the borders, or yes. maybe they dropped the ball in certain regards. And in the UK that you're talking about, yes, uh, Prime Minister Johnson has been uh, criticised by everybody, from Sarkis Tema to even uh, uh, members of his own uh, Party. However, I think what is instructive is the additional step that has now been taken to address the fears of people who think that the new measures that have now been uh, imposed, or if you like introduced, uh, will result to job losses and cause uh, a lot of hardship for the people. Yesterday, Chancellor Richie Sunak uh, announced, uh, he, he, scrapped, he more or less scrapped his uh, autumn budget and then introduced a number of measures uh, to help struggling businesses which can now access loans, uh, which subsidies are also to be introduced uh, to replace the follow scheme. Uh, there will be VAT cuts for also for companies uh, that are struggling. And under this new uh, scheme, what it means is a German st style scheme. Mm -hmm. What it means is that if you used to work 37 hours and you now have to reduce the number of hours yeah. uh, that you work, then the government will provide a top up so that you get, you still have the resources. But we'll see how that will work. But many, uh, People in the UK, they are more concerned also about uh, Christmas, how you know, they will not enjoy Christmas. <laughs> Christmas is an industry. But, but back home here, uh, there was a story in the papers, I think, uh, yesterday, yeah. about the uh, federal government of Nigeria planning to give $32 billion, yes. uh, to 32 states. Yes. Now, we didn't get uh, a chance to discuss that yesterday. Yes, Which states are these? And uh, you know, what criteria did they adopt in identifying those 32 uh, uh, 32 states. Why 32 and not 36 plus FCT? Uh, 35 plus, plus FCT. FCT. Um, um, of course, um, the PTF actually announced this on Monday in terms of the grant or the palliatives that will be given to the government to actually fight COVID-19. I'm not sure of the state. I cannot give for certain the states uh, that were uh, actually... Aaron, I'd yes. like to speak about that. Yeah. That, doesn't okay. that doesn't sit down well with me. Yes. I, 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 if, if I can say this, I don't want them you know, to give that money. 
to the states. You but know it's, why? It's something that is already cast I, in stone. I, it's cast in stone. Most yes. Of, most of 32 states will get a billion I naira know, each. I know, but it doesn't sit yes. that well with me. It's a personal opinion. You okay. know why? We have not gotten a forensic audit of how the billion spent so far was spent on COVID. We have not gotten a forensic audit on how much was spent on each isolation centers and the likes. Mm. We have not gotten a forensic audit on the palliative. And this goes to the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, how those palliatives were shared and people that were enriched. I just think this has been, become an all-commerce affair. It's man no man, this whole COVID thing. We are spending billions here and there. We have not even had a national memorial service to celebrate the over 1,000 people that have died as a result of COVID in this country. Nobody's even saying anything about that. That, that 32 billion will just go to the hands of rentiers, rent seekers, cronies, and the likes. Um, we want accountability. Rufai, um, that's all we want. Rufai, accountability. Rufai, the point is action and accountability are two different things. You cannot say because there, is no, there are no measures for accountability, uh, Aaron, action should not be Aaron, taken. Aaron, yes. Aaron, action without accountability is duplicity of nonsense. Let's be realistic Agreed, here. Agreed, but the dire situation we find ourselves. Because if you spend else. another 32 billion yes. and the people the money is supposed to get to doesn't get to them, is it not wasted? Is it not funneled funds? Well, I think what we can agree on. Yeah. And which uh, set up uh, that group, socio-economic rights and, and accountability, accountability for project, uh, has been pushing that government must give a proper account. Yes. And I cited the example before now of Lagos State, which took out two pages in newspapers to provide a proper list of both cash and material items that were given yes. to the uh, Lagos State uh, uh, government to fight COVID-19. No other state, yeah. to the best of my knowledge, has attempted that. But you have groups like uh, Serap, okay, you also have the media, you know, as we're doing now, uh, raising questions to say that COVID-19 should not become uh, a, an opportunity for corrupt self-enrichment. And we have had examples in Zimbabwe. One minister there was detained and taken to court because of even procurement. In even in South Africa. Because of a procurement scam yeah. around the COVID 19. And he couldn't explain, you know, how he, yeah. he came about inflated uh, figures. So it may be uh, an issue that uh, Nigerians will also have to uh, in, uh, discuss in, in, in great detail. In Aaron, Aaron. Yeah. For let now, me let's hope we'll be able to uh, yes. keep moving on. Aaron, let me cite a quick yeah. instance. Yeah. You remember the time states were crying for bailout, pay uh, Paris Club, uh, this and that, yeah. to pay salaries. Dr. Abati, did all the states still pay the salaries? <laughs> no, no, but no, 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 Rufai, the point is this. The, now, the South, now, the South African government, if we were to cite an example, mm -hmm. even though they've been, even though a lot of people in the ruling party have been embroiled in COVID-19 scandals, but they've still gone ahead to still do what they have to do. Because you cannot say because um, there are no accountability measures being put What's in place. The people on that the should Aaron? be people what? that should be catered for will not be catered for. Yeah, what you're trying to say, Aaron, yeah. I think is that you can walk and chew gum at the same time. Exactly. Action and exactly. accountability are not mutually exclusive. It can be simultaneous. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, Aaron. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks.